Ingrid and I are here to introduce our congregation to a project that we've been thinking about for a while, and that is to invite our senior members to review their life, to um, enjoy the experiences that they want to share with us, because it's a very spiritually enriching uh, process to do a life review. The sharing of stories is such a wonderful way to do that. I grew up in Oakland, California, and I am the oldest child in the family. I have a younger brother, about a year and a half, younger than I am, and uh, unfortunately he was killed in the Korean War, so he didn't really live very long. <laughs> uh, we lived with my grandmother because at, at an early time she uh, had an injury and she couldn't do her work. She ran a boarding house and so my mother filled in for her and we just stayed with her the whole time until I entered the convent. And, and uh, so we were really five in the family growing up. I went to St. Patrick's School in Oakland, California with the sisters of uh, St. Joseph of Crondelet. And I also took, uh, continued my music education with them. I took piano and learned how to play the organ at that time. And that stood me in great good need for the rest of my life because I've played a lot as, as a sister. Went on a weekend retreat up there, oh. asking the Lord, if it's his will, send the right person. Send the right person. And um, I happened to be walking down a lane. It was very dark, very late at night, but I wasn't troubled, I wasn't scared or anything, walking down just thinking and praying, and all of a sudden I heard my name, very clear, Rose. So I look around and I retrace my steps on the path where I had been, nobody's there, nobody, nobody. So I thought, this is strange, and I felt so overwhelmed that they had a little chapel there. So I went into the chapel, prayed and cried, and I thought, okay, Lord, whatever is your will, if you want me to come, I'll come. Because uh, things weren't working out the way I wanted. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna be his way. And through the years, all these changes took place. We finally had private rooms, and then we could go by ourselves. And then we were allowed to go for home visits, and then to weddings and to family functions, mm -hmm. baptisms, etc. Those were unique changes for us, mm -hmm. and I think well welcomed. Yes. And then when we were changing our given permission to change our names. I was given a marvelous that really surprised my family. I had no idea what it was about and what it meant. Yeah. But had, you, had you asked um, for uh, that name? When no, you, I didn't. No? What no. did you ask for? I asked for Mary Patrick for my father, Loretta Marie, and Mary Lourdes, something of the Blessed Mother. And I got Sister Amabilis. And it's the title, Mother Most Lovable. It's a beautiful name, but it was in Latin. And in the, after 50 years, I, uh, well, I had asked my mother when we got the permission, and what, is, what are you talking about? And I said, well, I can go back to Ellen. And she said, after all, all the time it took us to learn to say a marvelous, don't change your name. I said, okay. And then a few years later, I was at home with her and I said, you know, Mom, we can change our names. What do you mean? I said, I can go back to Ellen. Well, why don't you? I said, because some people object. Who? Well, you, you object, Mom. Oh, forget it, I'm an old lady. Do what you want to do. Change your name. <laughs> yeah. So. One thing I was 
very fortunate was to be mentored by Sister Mary Thomas. Mm -hmm. And she was so in tune with Mother Pia's perception of teaching in the schools. And one of the things that Mother Pia said over and over again, and she wrote over and over again, was that her teachers had to be well educated. Mm -hmm. And so she wanted us to go on uh, and for higher education and be the best teachers we could possibly be. She pushed that. Mm -hmm. She pushed teacher education. The hospital ministry was, was really special. Mm -hmm. It was because they meet all kinds of people and you get to be friends with them and they appreciate what you do. Mm -hmm. And uh, so many die and their families are so grateful that you gave them all that attention, you know, before. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a, it was a privilege for me to stand by the bedside of somebody who had, I like to say, one foot in the heaven and one foot in the grave. And the people would kind of smile at that, but they knew it was true. Mm -hmm. So uh, there were all kinds of uh, rewards for working in a hospital. Sometimes the rewards don't come when you're teaching. You see them later on when the boys and girls are more grown up. You, know, you mm -hmm. see it, but uh, but I I enjoyed the hospital work. I really did. Mm -hmm. Never yeah. never expecting to be kind of a long-term patient myself. Or Dominican life, how would you describe it? Kind of beckoning, I think, beckoning into the convent, uh, knocking at the front door. And uh, what I see now, I didn't see it then, but what I see now is hope and joy, anticipation, future, um, wanting to give a life of service to others, happiness happiness and I have to say this has been carried out in my life and I certainly wouldn't do it any different now. I would say that one of the values is collaboration and by that I mean working with all others that we are one human family and all of us have something to do with improving our neighborhood, our world and all of us have a gift to give to the human family, everyone. And that we, the gift that we give to the human family is probably the gift of what has been given to us by leaders who have been very inspired by who Jesus was. And the fact that Jesus loved so much the poor, the vulnerable. We see in the Gospels, whoever, the blind, the lame, all of the poor, the women caught in adultery, those, it didn't matter what their situation was, if he could help them with his compassion, love, and forgiveness, he did. In our congregation, our own focus is toward the young, the poor, and the vulnerable.